In this video, we're going to talk about organizational culture. What does that mean in HR practice? It's sometimes a bit nebulous. That's coming up right now. Hi there, I'm Andrea Adams and the host of HR Shop Talk. This is a show where you get all kinds of insights into all things HR. I encourage you to subscribe to the show by clicking on the button at the bottom of the screen. You can also subscribe to the podcast uh, to keep learning from my smart and experienced guests. Today's guest is Lauren Rubis. I'm pretty sure Lauren is a culture guru. I have seen him all over the place where the culture is being discussed. He teaches a course at Harvard on culture, and I went to a conference presentation he made on culture recently, so I'm delighted to have him. Hi, Lauren. How are you? Good, Andrea. How are you this morning? I am great. Enjoying the nice weather. Yes. And, you know, you you interview experienced and smart people. I just want to be clear to your audience. I'm on way over on the experience side, not on the smart side. Okay. <laughs> okay. Let's get started. Um, I feel like the definition of culture isn't clearly understood. And do you think that's an accurate perception or is it just me? And in any case, would you define it for us? Yeah, it's it's really mushy for sure. And I will try and define it here in a minute. It's mushy and it, and a lot of people look at it uh, through a different, through their own lenses, of course, as they should. And they see it in a certain perspective. Some people would equate culture to having a clear, you know, purpose statement or a mission and values. And that's, you know, that's culture. Other people see it as something more differently. But essentially, everybody has one. You have a culture. We all have a culture, whether it's in a home or a family or in a in an institution, organization. But essentially, in its in its simplest, more straightforward uh, way, it's kind of how things get done, right? It's what what people do to make things that they want to do happen, and the all the elements of the behaviors that go into that kind of define the culture of um, of a place. Okay. You know, I like to describe it a little bit as sort of that uh, operating system that sits underneath the products and services and processes and everything else. And it includes a lot of things that really, but really amounts to the behavior, the collective behavior of the people in the organization. So you talked about a culture, but mm -hmm. I've heard culture described, used to describe safety culture and coaching culture and collaboration culture. And there's just so many cultures that people talk about in their organization. Like, how do you make sense of that? Well, there are a lot of subcultures, you know, um, okay. and I think that's fair to kind of, you know, and, and within a large culture of an institution, depending how large it is, there are a lot of many cultures within that too, right? You know, you know, for example, when I work with Harvard, it's really interesting. Their IT people all wear ties and, and, and the women dress up kind of formally where they have something that is a surrogate for that tie. It's kind of their culture. When you bring it up to its highest level, though, there is a set of trends and behaviors that kind of define the culture overall. And some of those are constructive, thriving trends, and okay. some of them are destructive. Because when you and I go to an organization and we get an orientation maybe around from the, quote, HR team that we're talking to right here. There's an introduction, oftentimes there's a skim over values. This is how we do things here. But when we go right and we sit down with people around left and right, this is, and we ask them over a coffee or over a beer or something, we go, how the hell do things really get done here? Like, you know, that's what we're asking. That's the culture. That's the real culture of the institution. Yeah. Even the same industries, the same markets, the same neighborhoods, they're very different. And mm -hmm. uh, Somebody at and some with, with some level of influence on the resources, the founder, the owner, the top leadership team, the C-suite, you name it, has an influence on determining what gets done and not done. And other people either fall into that pattern or resist it or combinations thereof. That's the culture. We're human beings and no one is going to have a perfect culture. I can guarantee you that. Yes. But if you're moving more towards thriving or there tend to be more constructive things in the culture than negative things, you're going to move the organization somewhat forward. You're going to thrive more. It's messy. Yes. Yeah, it's kind of squishy, messy, gooey. Yes. That's exactly what it is. A bunch of yes. human beings together doing shit and excuse me. And that makes <laughs> us, uh, that make, that's what culture is. 
Next question. So whose job is it to manage or steward culture? Yeah, there's only one real chief culture officer, and that's the person who has the full responsibility for the end-to-end -end behavior of the use of the resources in the organization, really. That, you know, you can have the title, like I have, and um, but really, you're, you're acting on behalf of the C-suite or the top leadership. However, until you have everybody involved in, in intentionally thinking about culture, you're really, you're really not going to uh, move it very much. It's one of those interesting challenges in that it's not a top-down marketing program. It's not a, you don't roll it out classically and you never done. And so yeah. it's a relentless kind of uh, uh, movement of a complex system. And you know, complex systems require organic uh, activity to kind of move directionally. Okay, so uh, in, and in all of that, what role does HR play? To answer the question directly about HR, there's such a fundamental part because when you think about activating or amplifying the behavior you want, the work you want, yeah. HR has so much influence on that. From the beginning and the yes. first ad yes. to the, to the pre-ad to the welcome, orientation, right through to leaving, right. HR owns that journey. That's a big bundle of stuff that HR owns. Yep. can really advance or frankly, in many cases, make the culture go backwards. That's the other side of this thing. Right. And that's why the Gilbert cartoon on the hated, uh, you know, uh, metaphor of the HR person is so resident in that cartoon because most of us have been on the dark side of HR. Yes. The sneaky conversations to get you out without paying you a good severance package, all the other crap that we get drawn into that minimizes us and, and diminishes us and, as opposed to advancing. Okay, so we've talked about a whole bunch of other of factors that um, are driving culture. Is there anything else we should uh, talk about? Yeah, you know, and this is this is a this is a shameless plug for for a body of work that I've done, and I okay, you know, I've spent. Of my 40 years and trying to reflect back around, okay, on um, when I really have advanced the culture, what really worked? What did I do? What did others around me do? What did we do collectively? Because you never do it by yourself, right? You're always, and if you're advancing something, you got to, you're lucky to have a bunch of other really strong advocates around you. And then I went and I did as much of the research as possible to kind of figure out okay, what's the evidence behind that either supports this or makes me think differently. And I came up with 10 necessary elements. One is that you have to put people first, so it's it's people and process. Uh, so I mean, I mean, people and customer obsessed. So you've got to really believe that your customers can't be any happier than your people are. There's just no way. Right. Okay. You know, you've got to have put you got to put people at the front of the line to get those financial results that you that you ultimately want. Uh, your business not a model will, unless you're friggin' lucky. You've got cryptocurrency or some something. <laughs> you're not, you're okay. Not gonna. You know, the well, model, 20, the, 20 years the ago. Business, yeah, the business itself is not going to make you a lot of money. Uh, it doesn't just propel itself. Um, the second thing is that you have to have a you have to be purpose driven. And now I like to be involved in purpose driven cus customers that co companies that I believe in. But for I was talking to someone who that was the chief experience officer for Jewel, the device that delivers vape, uh, vaping and marijuana. I wouldn't want to be part of that organization, mm. but it's purpose driven. Yep. And that's effective when you're purpose driven, you got to be clear about what you're trying to do to make uh, humankind advance ideally. Um, so that the purpose, it's not, it's more than mission. It's more than vision. And that's hard work. You have to have intentional modern values that by and large in a highly diverse, ideally diverse organization, glue people together. Mm -hmm. uh, and those need to be modern. They can't be just uh, glib kind of one word, integrity or communication or silliness like that. <laughs> they, they, I love they, this. <laughs> they need to, I think I'm they hearing need angels to be, right now. They need to be something that says, you know, no assholes uh, invited here. <laughs> uh, and, and I'm being a little bit uh, crass on purpose. I'm trying to make a point around 
needs to be in language that really makes sense and accessible to people. And um, that's hard to do too. And then you need to have, be clear about what your leadership system, because leadership is a practice. And so when you say, well, I want great leadership here, you can't say, well, go read Brene Brown's book and come back and you're good. I wish mm. you could. Yeah. It's a practice, right? And then you have to have the ability for people to have a growth and disruptive mindset because, you know, what, this idea that people resist change is such nonsense. Mm. We, that's all we are. We are, think, look at your life, Andrea. Your life and my life has been nothing but change. What we, what we grieve are things we lose and change. So you have to have a growth and disruptive mindset and you have to um, play and experiment and have fun and try stuff out. And at the end of the day, you have to walk in thinking of your last day, your first day. Um, you, you're, uh, you, you're not, none of us has got a job. Like every one of us is going to have a last day. We have a, we're doing something right now. It happens to be described as a job. But if we wake up in the morning and think that that's permanent and that's going to last for, for a long time, or uh, boy, I'll tell you, we are, we're in for a surprise. So w the, the one way to make sure that we're always getting something out is we're building our personal equity. We're adding to our capabilities and to our mm -hmm. skills so that we can go out and continue to contribute until we really have a last day, which, you know, I'm closer to than you are. <laughs> yeah, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we don't. You, you never know. None of us know. All right. Uh, there you go. That's my little bit of a, that, that, those are the 10 elements. You can find them on my website. I okay. deeply believe in them and they're easier to talk about than to activate. But if you don't have them, you're not going to have a, you're, you're not going to have your culture thrive as much as you want. If you've learned something here, subscribe to see all the episodes and talk to us. What have you experienced managing culture in your own organization? Tell us in the comment section below. So back to you, Lauren, I've heard you speak and there you talked about intentional culture. Mm -hmm. um, can you tell us now what you mean by that? Yeah, it means uh, that the top leadership um, ideally says, um, makes a statement that says, we want to have a thriving culture here. We do. Mm -hmm. And then says, ask the question, how do we do that? And is humble enough to go, you know, we need to have everybody involved, engaged in, in participating in that, and then starts to activate work to actually first define what that thriving culture looks like for them. Like, if you could, if you could paint a narrative uh, X number of years out, 10 years out, ideally, and write a story, and, and literally, if you could get the top team, write the story of the behavior, what would be happening in an ideal setting, uh, or paint a picture of it or do it. Think about how fun and creative that is to define it. And take a couple of personas. Take an Andrea, a Lauren, uh, take a number of personas and write the story through their eyes. What would it look like if this was a thriving culture? What would it feel like? What would it taste like, smell like? Uh, what would the emotional connection to it be? And then kind of look and say, that would be cool. And then back up from where you are and say, Okay, in a stumbling kind of forward ambling movement, how, how effectively and successful can we get there? And that includes rocking it out with your financial results or your customer results or whatever. So the other reason you want to thrive in culture is that I guarantee you bad stuff happens in toxic cultures. Just look around. What do you think happened at Boeing? You think those guys don't know how to make airplanes? Mm-hmm. You think Volkswagen doesn't know how to make a more emission-free car or yeah. Wells Fargo knows how to sell bank accounts without screwing 6 million people over with fees on accounts that they didn't even ask for? They know that. But bad stuff happens when people are afraid to speak up or they think they can't or they make choices that are, are frankly, evil. And that's why Google for a long time had, we will do no evil. <laughs> they had it as a statement. They pulled it down a couple of years ago. I don't know why. I'd like to find out a little bit more about why they chose to pull it down. But anyway, you get my point, right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so we've talked, um, you know, about culture and culture being nebulous. But is there a way of making it less neb nebulous, of of measuring it? Yeah. So one of the so let's talk about measuring it and then talk about making it less nebulous. Oh wow! I'm glad I'm glad there is a way. 
Yeah, there is a way. So, um, you know, there are some and a, and a small few of actually true culture indexes out there, but there are some in the market. Okay. When I was the chief people officer at um, ATB and, um, and then my uh, people that followed after me, uh, they ended up building a, an index, which is always what I wanted to do. So you could take the Great Place to Work Trust Index, the A on you at um, engagement survey, they're not A anymore, I forget who they are. And you think about it in, a, in its simplest thing, how many people are lined up to be part of your organization, mm. right? How many people are leaving your organization and, and for what reasons? How many customers are lining up to join your organization? What's the spend of wallet? You can put that whole basket of goods together and if they're going up, you and it's hard to find full uh cause and effect but you can find some correlation to work and you can mm -hmm. find um you know we kind of know if we do a little more of this a little more of this happens we know exactly how and why not really my point is that there's a basket of things use those mm -hmm. as your survey okay and try and get those going up and activate those 10 elements i was talking to you about but okay. think big start small act now like you know if you're if people if you find out that people can't declare what your purpose is Work on your purpose. If your values are a bunch of baloney okay. and sit there and no one ever want, does anything about it, work on that. If you work on your leadership system and you teach them how to have crunchy conversations, because mm -hmm. most people don't grow up and know how to have a decent conversation without everybody being pissed off and mad and or avoiding it and all that kind of stuff, work on that. Right. And soon, because these things tend to work organically, like I mentioned, yeah, yeah. The system hobbles forward. Huh. Sometimes it even sprints forward for a bit. Huh. Interesting. Pretty soon you turn around and you go, we're one of the best places to work in Canada. How cool is that? And we're making all of our numbers. And you know what? It won't last as long, very long because before you know it, someone come along, kick you in behind, and you got to do it all over again. And uh, yeah, or, or leaders leave that committed to it. And different leaders come in with different people. All that's just part of life. And part yeah. of the way it works. It's relentless. You never stop. And yeah. it's fun. It's fun yeah. to do. Just hard, messy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know that some people are a little skeptical about all this talk about culture, like it's trendy or a fad. Yeah. So what's your take on that? Is it trendy? Is it a fad? Are we just starting to collectively realize how important it is? Well, I definitely think there's an uh, awareness around how important it is, and and um, that's emerged around uh, mm -hmm. years. And, and 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 data doesn't change very many many people's minds at all. However, you know, you'd have to be uh, numb not to look at McKinsey or Deloitte's work or all that work that people have done, and they'll say that people that if you take just the great place to work organizations that have won that award. Mm -hmm. And, and you just did an index with those companies, publicly traded companies versus the market, they outperformed by 20, over a 20 year study, they outperformed by a significant percentage. And then there's all the stuff about when bad stuff happens and boards are getting, go, holy crap, bad stuff happens because of culture issue. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, right. if you're an investor in Uber, you don't like to hear that the guys have decided to throw kegs of beer off the roof of the Ritz Carlton on their celebration event. And, and then the third thing, which has really been emphasized by COVID, but it'll, it's a never ending thing is that you need to have enough, your culture needs to be adaptive. And if you don't have a somewhat thriving culture that people can work on the right things at the right time, you're going to get thumped because you're going to not have the right conversations. You're not going to make the right choices can make poor decisions, not going to use resources. So all those things, Andrea, together yeah. have made people more aware. So it's way more than a trend. But yes. at one level, I don't care mm. because yeah. it's not a choice. You have a culture. Yes. So it doesn't matter if, you know, people want to be cynical. Go ahead. You know, you don't want to put an intention on anybody. I don't, I don't want to be out trying to convince people. You have one. And... If you do your homework, you're going to realize that you could have, you have, need to put intentionality behind it and you got to make the workplace better than less. You know, in some ways, I believe people have a have a right to want it, to work in a place where they can contribute and thrive. Don't you think so? I don't mean an entitlement. I just yes. mean 
you know, we ought to be able to go to expect that we go to a place and we get, you know, reasonably treated reasonably well and we yes. get to bring our best work and do good stuff. Well, thanks, Lauren. I'm so glad I've had this chance to talk to you about culture because there's been aspects that have perplexed me over the years. We've reached the end of this episode. You may be interested in an episode on safety, which is a frequently discussed aspect of culture. Check that out here. Thanks for watching and see you next time.